I'm Susie Wiseman, and this is Jacobin Radio. The podcast today plays the first part of the 2018 inaugural session of UCLA's Center for Social Theory and Comparative History program with political economist Mark Blythe, author of Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, and The Future of the Euro. The first five minutes of the podcast have some glitches which smooth out thereafter, so do stay tuned. Blythe, with his characteristic sardonic take on economic policy, takes us through the evolution of the economy since the 1940s. Ten years after the crash of 2008, thanks to a multi-trillion dollar bailout of the failing banks, but not for foreclosed homeowners, finance still dominates the world economy. Inequality has worsened. There's a new and skyrocketing bubble in finance and real estate. But an American nationalist populist is president. Britain is headed to Brexit. Populist challenges from left and right persist. So everything has happened and nothing has changed or everything has changed and nothing has happened, as they said in Russia after it disintegrated. Mark Blythe joins us for a deeper look at the transformations of the last decade nationally and internationally with a special take on Trumpism, that is, populism characterized by nationalism, protectionism, and opposition to globalization and finance around the globe. Here now, Mark Blythe. So let's get started. The idea is 10 years on from the crash. So first, let's begin with the disappointment. This is a left-leaning crowd. You should be leased to disappointment. That's basically what we specialize in. So... I'm not doing this. This is what it said in the preamble. So our speakers will examine the transformation of the last decade at national and international levels and reveal how the Democratic and Republican parties alike have driven the greatest upward distribution of income of the ultra-rich since the Gilded Age, enriching politicians as well as top corporate managers. They will ask whether the skyrocketing financial bubble and standard real economy will combine to bring about... I'm not doing any of that. <laughs> I have absolutely no interest in doing any of that. There's other people who do that stuff. Here's what I will do. I'm going to talk about what actually happened in 2008 to 2010 in the United States. Because if you're going to do 10 years on from the crash, it's easy to forget what happened. And so much of it is so important to where we are now. I'm going to talk about how that became such a problem for Europe. Because if you remember, when the crisis started, Pierre Steinbrück, who was the social democratic finance minister, said, this is a crisis of Anglo-Saxon capitalism. Nothing to do with us. 11 months later, you had a problem. So what happened? I want to then talk about where all this came from. That's the line from the Global Trumpism piece in terms of this has been 30 years in the making and it's not going away anywhere soon. And then finally I want to talk about not just what that means in terms of the populist reaction, but what this means for our understanding of party politics. Because I think this has also been utterly transformative of the way that we think about politics as construed through political parties as we generally understand them. And then the last one is, and why we will survive all of this despite generic leftist pessimism. I've got to the point now when I switch on The Guardian in the morning, I just want to shoot myself. <laughs> I mean, did anybody read George Monbrot's column this morning? I mean, really, why get out of bed? I mean, seriously, just, just shoot yourself, it's that bad. I'm, I'm fed up of this uber pessimism, I can't do it anymore. So, in the words of David Byrne, how did we get here? So, there's some uh, bubbles. Now, remember the thing about, there's a thing called the real economy, there's a thing called the financial economy, and essentially financial instruments are meant to be replicants of the real economy, no matter how complex these things are. So, if your real economy is chugging along at 2%, your financial sector is meant to grow at 2%. So if you have a look at this chart, what you'll find is the DJIA, which is the Dow Jones, the FTSE and the Nikkei, and particularly for the Anglosphere, you've got 6% a year compounded growth going into the crisis in equities on an underlying economy of 2%. That's a bubble. By definition, that's a bubble. Next one, uh, housing bubbles. Well, you know that shed that you bought in the back of Dublin Airport? went up by 130% for no apparent reason over a 10 year period. And that went almost everywhere except Hong Kong, who were still recovering from their own housing collapse 15 years later. So you have these two giant asset classes of equities and real estate, both on a massive tear for in one case 20 years and another case 10 years before it all goes wrong. So why was it so difficult to see those bubbles? Why was it so difficult to see it coming? Anybody know who this is? David Vinear, CFO of Goldman Sachs at the time of the crisis. The line is, we are seeing things that are 25 standard deviation moves several days in a row. Well, when you consider that 25 standard deviations is three times, no, 10 standard deviations is three times in the life of the universe. 
25 standard deviations is pretty much out there. Now, why would somebody who's obviously very smart, after all, he makes tons of money at Goldman and they can rip your grandmother's face off and make her feel good about it, why is it that he's saying such obviously silly things as regarding statistics? And the answer is this. The way that we think about risk or thought about risk in the banking system was wrong, fundamentally wrong. There was an idea that if you made each of the component parts safe, the system was safe, that it was scalable, that it was additive, and that basically risk was normally distributed. So there's a technology called value at risk, which allowed you to basically estimate what, how much you had out in terms of risk assets at any particular point, summing that up to one nice number. Now, the problem with this is very simple. There's loads of hidden correlation in the banking sector, and it was built through mortgages, but it could have been through any other asset class. And essentially what you end up with is too much leverage in the system all at once, Everything is connected to everything else. My hedge is your hedge. There's no differentiation. My risk asset is the same risk asset you're in. We're all pulling in the same direction. So you build an incredibly tightly entrained, very, very tightly wound system with a huge amount of leverage. If you start to estimate the probabilities of things going wrong, they're wrong, i.e. you don't take account of tail risk, it's going to go crashing down among serious. So first one. So what does that mean? It means if you think about a world in terms of modeling risk or uncertainty, we actually live in a world basically between quadrants two and three. So if you think about complex payoffs, a world of convexities, all the way up, all the way down. And then you think about the tails on the distribution, not normal, they're actually out there and quite far, then where do you live? In our world, you don't run into 11 foot tall people. But banking crisis is the 11, is it walking into an 11 foot tall person. And we do it way more than 25 times or three times or zero times in the life of the universe. We do this all the time. Banking crisis frequencies have been going up since the end of the Bretton Woods era, both in the severity and their magnitude right across the world. So again, why didn't we see this? And it's again partly because we just don't have the optics for doing it, because it's not just a question of data, it's the fundamental way that we understand risk versus uncertainty in the way that we play with assets. So that was one weakness that was in there. That hasn't been remedied. We still do exactly the same thing now. That's why I'm mentioning this. Some other large problems. If you go back to the 1970s, which we will shortly, the 1970s was a period that was very weird for many reasons, but for one of them it was because you had historically very low real interest rates because of the effect of inflation. And what that meant was when you released finance from its post needle box in an environment of high but very rapidly declining inflation, interest rates fall lower, fall less than inflation rates once they're under attack after the Volcker shock. So you end up with, in the 1980s, very high real interest rates, which is why you have the Wall Street moment. It's impossible not to make money when you're getting 9% real for showing up at Citibank in 1983. So when you've got that, you have an environment which you've got your credit starved, huge demand for pent-up credit, very high real interest rates. How do you make money when everybody's piling in to make that money? How do you make money on a declining spread? The only way you can do is to play the game by volume, so the up the leverage. So the hidden, the hidden fracture, if you will, in the financialized system is that to continue to make money, you have to pile on leverage more and more and more. So what this chart shows you is just before 2008, what was happening in the banking systems of the world. And the most famous one, of course, is up there with Iceland, where you've got a thousand percent of GDP in bank assets and basically a rock in the middle of the ocean that doesn't produce anything. Now, how do you get to that position? You get to that position because people forget something or in fact they've never been told it. What banks called assets are actually liabilities. So I have the example I usually give is I have a condo in Boston. That's an asset. Not to a bank it's not, it's a liability because they don't want to manage real estate. They're interested in the mortgage attached to the property, which to them is an asset, but to me is a liability. Assets and liabilities sum to zero, hence why in most economics prior to the crisis, nobody worried about either distribution or finance. One person's income is another person's debt, etc., etc. But when you've got all that built in terms of leverage, that is to say your operating capital is 2% and your daily operating leverage is 60 to 1, Bundes, uh, for example, um, what do you call Deutsche. it? Deutsche Bank, right? Then you are just an accident waiting to happen. And this was not unique to Iceland. As you can see from those figures, this went right through the system. So you have a micro level weakness in that you can't understand the risks you're running, but you think that you do. And you have a macro level weakness in the fact that the whole system is interconnected and levered up to an extent you can't possibly imagine. Then we decide to really turbocharge this by having a really screwed up way of borrowing money. So rather than relying on depositors, we we'll by and large the banking systems gave up on depositors and went straight to repo wholesale markets. So take the example of Apple, it sits on a giant cash pile, what does it do with it? It lends out a bit of its cash pile overnight and then it takes in exchange for that some kind of collateral so that if you don't pay back the loan they've at least got the collateral. 
We were running out of AAA collateral, which was T-bills, in part because loads of them were being hoarded in Asia as an after effect of the great financial crisis of 1997. So what did we substitute them for? Sovereign debt. That was the European story, in part because the European Commission in 2001, in an attempt to build European repo markets, put a directive out that said all European sovereign debt issued in euros will be treated the same in repo transactions regardless of the country of origin. You just made Germany into Greece by fiat and vice versa. In the American side, we went for AAA mortgages because after all, hey, they were AAA. That means that they're as good as a T-bill. So you can do huge amounts of borrowing overnight and lending 30 years on the assumption that liquidity is perfect and markets are perfect. That's another accident waiting to happen because you get collateral calls and the whole thing falls apart. Similarly, the whole notion of securitization spreading risk around proved to be a bit of a canard. There was the whole issue of CDS and basically building insurance policies onto bonds and then when you run out of bonds using the income streams from the insurance policies to create new synthetic bonds so you had an infinite number of mortgage replicants. This was incredibly dangerous, unbacked financial speculation. In a model in which you don't know the risks you're running, you can't calculate the leverage and you don't know the hidden interdependencies in the system. You get where I'm going with this. And then on top of that, we have a whole bunch of economic ideas we believe for the past 30 years that turn out to be total crap. That markets are efficient, that banks have skin in the game. No, they don't. They have everyone else's skin in the game. That people have rational expectations, that investors basically value risk, that systemic risk is the same as individual risk, and that too big, too, too big to fail is not a problem because we're managing risks well. And the take home, of course, was the whole was different from the sum of the parts. And we only knew that in that moment of crisis when it all went wrong. So what's the take home on the first part of coming back 10 years after the GFC in the United States? The cost of this for the United States was 13 to 15 trillion in lost output, bank recapitalization and everything else. At a time in which we have no money for schools, no money for infrastructure, we can always find a trillion and a half to give people who already have everything even more money. But it's amazing how much money we can just magic out of nowhere to save the assets to the banking system when we have to. This, of course, is paid for by sticking private debt on the public balance sheet, which is why you have a jump in public debt to 40%. And then the purpose of the book on austerity was to point out how that was the greatest bait and switch in human history. Because by basically bailing out the banking assets of the top 20% of the population and then putting that on the public balance sheet in the form of public debt, then tightening the belt to cut spending, you're effectively taking the costs of that insurance and dumping it on the one part of the population that can least afford to pay it. Wages have been where they were since 2008, nothing has changed for the bottom 60% and they've been stagnant for a generation. And I won't read it out because I'm sure you've read it already, but basically there's the best statistic I can find. In 2015, bonuses on Wall Street after the bailout were twice as much as everybody's minimum wages for the same year. So what's the Euro story? If you think that's fun, wait till you see this one. <laughs> this is interest rate convergence in Euro uh, bonds over a 30 year period. It's also the greatest moral hazard trade in human history. So here's how this works. If you look at the red line at the top, that's Greek debt before there's ever a euro. Why is it so expensive? Well, because it's Greece. Their tax collection's bullshit. They lie about their accounts. They don't make anything. Uh, guess what? You're going to pay 25% to hold the debt. That's a one in four implied probability of default. That's a market price and shit correctly. That's how this works, right? Interestingly though, even if you go around here, what have you got? Italy, you got, you know, Greece, things like that, Spain, the Netherlands, they're all tracking between 15 and 10%. Now why is this? Well, because if you're a bond investor, you care about two things, exchange rate risk and inflation risk. And there was this magical new thing called the euro that was going to come in, and we announced it in advance. And what it meant was nobody would have a currency anymore. And that meant that there's no inflation risk and there's no exchange rate risk. Now, if that's the case, I know what's going to happen is that the yields on those bonds are going to go down and the prices are going to go up. I want to be in at the start. I want to buy as many of those bonds as possible because they're going to become more expensive over time as the yield goes down. I can add that to my capital base and lever up my financial institution. I can become too big to fail as a business model. And that takes us back to that slide where three French banks have 233% of GDP, two German banks have 160% of German GDP, four Icelandic banks have 1,000% of GDP. It's all built into the script. 
Now, here's the deal. I've got national regulators. I'm a French bank. Let's say I'm Credit Agricole. I used to be a farmer's bank. I then become one of the largest unbacked derivatives traders in the world in short order. And I start to buy as much sovereign crap as I possibly can because I'm chasing that spread down. And I'm making money on a declining spread. So I'm buying more of the stuff and more of this stuff. And eventually I become huge. I'm 100% of French GDP and my assets that could become liabilities. And I go to the regulator and say, you've got a problem. I'm playing a moral hazard trade against you. I've become too big to fail. I can take excessive risk because you'll bail me out. And the French regulator said, no, because we don't have a printing press anymore, asshole. So what this means is you're going to have to go to the ECB, and that's run by the Germans. So good luck with that one. (laughs) But they called their bluff, and they kept doing it. So what you saw is this interest rate convergence going into the period of the euro, and the minute there's a shock to the system, boom, it turns out Greece is still Greece. It turns out that all that risk that was in there was completely suppressed and was not true. Now, the way this is usually told, the official version, is very convincing, but it's fundamentally wrong. So the official story is that all of this interest rate convergence leads to a huge amount of bond buying, which gives tons of money to periphery sovereigns. This enables them to have very lax public finances. So, see, Ireland spends a lot of money. Spain. It's like Greece, Portugal, Spain, right? It's the pigs, right? So, they've got very lax public finances. In other words, they're spending money through the government because they think it's a good idea. That's called lax public finances, right? This, in turn, erodes wage competitiveness. So, relative to Germany, your unit labour costs go up, you become less competitive. Would be important if you were a net exporter, but a lot of these countries aren't, but put that to one side. Uh, This shows up in current account imbalances. Basically, everybody ends up running a a deficit against the Germans because they're super competitive and everyone else's wages are too expensive. And all of that is financed, as I said, by external debt increases, borrowing from core banks who are buying periphery assets, which are then becoming cash that you're using to buy BMWs. That's basically the story. Now, as a result of this, you get the pigs. Concerns about long-term sovereignty of Europe's periphery leads to a collapse in confidence and a capital flight to safety, that being buy boons, dump these assets. Bond traders sell the risky Mediterranean sovereign debt in the greatest moral hazard trade in human history and perceive risk-free assets such as British bills, German boons, US treasuries become the thing. That's when the spreads go up. That's the yield for Italy going to 7%. That's the sovereign debt crisis. Sounds convincing, totally wrong. That's not actually what happened. And that's my new word, washed. That should be what happened, but never mind. All right. Actually, the blame lies with the creditors and capital flows. Why? Well, you can't have over-borrowing without over-lending. We, we tend to forget this one, right? I would love to over-borrow. They just won't lend me the money. But back then, because they were pricing in a yield convergence they knew were going to happen, they were throwing money at these people. So what were they meant to do? They took it, right? The core banks were encouraged to do this because of that uh, repo market regulation of 2001 that said if you're buying Greece, you're buying Germany. But here's the thing. Here's the spread on Greece. Here's the spread on Germany. Watch me. Sorry, vice versa. Watch me buy Greece. Right? It's going to make more money off this. This is the leverage amplifier that builds up the banking system. This is what leads to the unit labour cost deterioration. Right? It's because of the flow of capital. And that's the last purchasing of periphery assets. Here's the evidence for this. This is in 2011, foreign banks combined consolidated claims on Greece, Ireland, Portugal and Spain, right? 33% of French GDP is basically impaired periphery assets. A third of the size of the economy is junk assets they bought on a moral hazard trade. Same for the Netherlands, same for the Germans. Interesting. Here's another one. Assets held by banks in Germany, France and the UK in 2012 were double the annual GDP of the entire EU. So if one of those banks fell over and they're interconnected, what do you think is going to happen to the whole system? This is about saving a banking system that's twice the size and twice as levered as the United States. There's the United States for comparison. Its top five banks come to 61% of GDP. There's the, uh, the relationship in the EU. It's two and a half times GDP. So that's why we had austerity policies. It was all about stopping a bank, around, a bank run around the European bond market. But the problem is, you can't solve banking problems with budget cuts. You can try, but it doesn't work. Uh, you can't solve liquidity problems with uh, solvency problems with liquidity instruments. And eventually, if you try and run what is de facto a gold standard for a decade, people will get pissed and revolt. And that's what began to happen. If you suppress volatility to that extent, it's going to find a way up and a way out.
You're listening to a talk by Mark Blythe at UCLA's Sistich or Brenner Center. This is Jacobin Radio. And now back to Mark Blythe. So, consequences of all this. For once, let's not talk about Trump and let's not talk about Brexit. Let's talk about this. Because there's lots of trumpets, and they're not just blowing on the right, they're also blowing on the left. If you have a look at southern Europe, its party systems in Italy and Spain have been completely transformed because of left-wing populism, not because of right-wing populism. If you have a look at Spain, Spain has no right-wing populist party. There's very different shades of this, and it's a global phenomenon from Scotland all the way through to Catalonia, all the way through to Italy. But it's all dying out, right? Because at the start of last year, the guy who looks like a fake James Bond villain (laughs) didn't actually become the guy who leads the Dutch. And then the Le Pen family business was going out. And even the numbers in Europe were getting bigger. Things were happening. Unemployment's going down. Growth is going up. It's fantastic. You know why? Because in 2015, they stopped squeezing budgets. The automatic stabilizers kicked in and it started to grow. And that's why Spain's growing because it's got a 5% deficit. It's that simple. But anyway, let's move along. Unfortunately, it seems that populism's back. That's the German elections. Now, there's a very interesting thing about this. Everyone gets freaked out quite rightly about the AFD getting 12.6% of the vote. But if you think about the left side of this, the Greens and the left party, the Linke, add that together, that's more than the AFD. Add the three of them together, and that's more than the SPD gets. Now, that is an opinion poll in FAS, yes, two days ago. The latest opinion polls in the SPD gives them between 17 and 18% of the vote. They're done. The post-war middle parties, the ones that brought us neoliberal compromise, they're reaping the whirlwind of what they have sown. So what's the long-run macro story on how we got here? Forgive me if you've heard this before. I like to think of this in terms of shifts in economic regimes, very much uh, owe a debt to sort of uh, Robert Boyer's work and regulation school thinking on this. When I went to graduate school, that was what the rage was. And then basically we went to varieties of capitalism instead and and now we've went back because there's much more politics in this. But this is my version of that story. Coming out of the Great Depression, there's one concern right across what we now call the OECD. Don't go back to mass unemployment. Really bad things happen when you do that. So full employment becomes the policy target regardless of how you get there. Supply side, demand side doesn't really matter. These are national economies in the sense that financial flows are extremely restricted. As The Economist magazine put it in 1946, things that you can buy, sell and drop on your foot, good. Things that speculate, bad. Cola contracts or corporatism in the, in, uh, the European theatre. Big labour, big capital getting together. Conflation control through institutions such as that become the norm. Very high taxes and transfers. And I think a really great bit of information. Nobody knows who runs the central bank because it's essentially the check cashing agency of the treasury. Jump forward a mere 10 years from the end of that regime in the 1980s and what do you find? Price stability is the number one goal. Inflation is the problem, not unemployment. Globalization is the name of the game rather than nationally restricted markets. Open financial markets, flexible and globalized labor markets, low taxes and transfers, and everybody knows who runs the central bank because essentially parties have given up trying to govern the economy in any meaningful sense. So evidence for this? Well, if you have a look at U.S. corporate profits and allow a time lag for basically the reset from the high inflation period to a low inflation period, you can kind of see it there. Let's remind ourselves that at this point in time, U.S. corporates have never made as much money as they are making today. The shift against the labor share of income has never been higher, even in the Gilded Age. Next one, U.S. inflation. Now, that's all pretty well. If you think of the first regime as being labor friendly, you pay for it with productivity improvements up to a point that you can't when that breaks down and investment collapses, you get a kind of Kalekian effect and ultimately you get stagflation. Then you disinflate the system and you build the new one. You see it in there, but here's the best one. Bond yields. It's just beautiful. (laughs) Now, here's another one you've probably seen. Productivity versus compensation since the 1940s. Look what happens in 1973. Click. There's wage stagnation right there. Now, we know what ended the first regime. It was inflation. Whether it was the internal Kalekian dynamics of the collapse of the full employment economy, whether it was the Triffin dilemma at the heart of Bretton Woods, whether it was the oil shocks, whether it was all of the above concatenated in one nasty package, 
that was the problem. And essentially, if you're going to try and run capitalism in a world in which if you've got an estimated rate of return of 5% and inflation goes to 7 and you've got negative 2, you're burning money. Your investor class isn't going to put up with that shit. So they didn't. So they refinanced politics. And that was these guys. And we spend a lot of time thinking about the Reagans and the Thatchers and the neoliberal revolution, but we forget about their institutional consequences. That being inflation targeting, central banks, the revolution of macroeconomics that justified it. That was almost, if not more, important. Because what it allowed was a removal of responsibility for economic outcomes from governments, not just towards markets and individuals, but towards technocracies, which has become incredibly important. Now, when the crisis hit, in the 1970s, we allowed the system to fail, and for better or worse, there was a system reset. That's one way to think about Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberalism, etc. It isn't working, press, alt, control, delete, start again, restart the machine. But this time we didn't. What we did was we bailed the system. And that's the balance sheet of the Fed, and that's the balance sheet of the ECB. So you're essentially not allowing a reset to happen. So you've had wage stagnation, you've had an incredible inequality skew, and you have not allowed the system to reset when it's crashed. In fact, you've doubled down on it. Now, let's ask one question. Where did all that leverage in the system come from? And the red line is the one you want to look at, bank assets to GDP. An incredible rise in the leverage in the system. Well, that was generated by wage stagnation because that leverage had to go somewhere. Here's my favorite little slide from that period. A city bank in 2003, 2005 had an advertising campaign called Live Richly. Let's think about that for a minute, folks. It's not save up and buy yourself something nice. It's live richly. It's live on credit. I lived in Baltimore in the early 2000s for my sins. And even there, when I went away for a weekend, when I opened up the door and walked through the door, I tripped over the number of credit card offers I was getting. Right? This is what Colin Couch calls privatized Keynesianism. We gave up on public sector balance sheet finance and I went to private sector balance sheet finance on every asset class we could. Now, why were we doing this? Because the gap between wages and profits had become absolutely astronomical. There's euro area consumer credit, it's doubled in real terms, and there's exactly the same thing for the United States prior to the crisis. So you're filling it in. Literally, credit card nation is not a title, it's actually what happened. So what happens when you bail out that massively levered system in 2008? Now, this is the austerity proof. Net public debt in the eurozone, oops, don't do that, go back there. That's it, where's my laser? Net public debt is going down into the crisis. There's an orgy of spending. Bullshit. It was going down, right? Notice the timing. 2007 through 2008. What did we do? Oh, yeah, we built out the global banking system. That's right. And what do you get? A massive rise in debt to GDP. Funny, the same thing happens in the US. I mean, you know, it's a bit like curing a headache with a cut. Got a headache, pick up the cat, rub the cat in your head, put it down, your headache goes away. Obviously, the cat cured the headache. This is purely correlative. No, yeah, of course, right? We bailed it out. That's what it was. Now, here's the weird thing. So far, we've put, if you include the latest QE figures from Europe into it and, and some other opaque things, there's been about $15 trillion of interventions have gone into the global money supply through the big central banks. And here's the weird thing. Inflation's nowhere. There is no inflation. Right? We're talking about normalizing rates. We're talking normalizing to where we should be, which is 2%. Why do you raise interest rates? Because you have pressure from wages. There's no wage pressure. They're not going anywhere. There's, we talk about gains. New York Times every now and again says, wages are rising like on a three-month basis. They've been stagnant for 30 years. Right? Uh, prices in wholesale goods are going down. Uh, the Eurozone core inflation numbers are still trending downwards rather than upwards. And we've chucked 15 trillion, 17 trillion by one count, into the global money supply. Now, that's weird because what did Milton tell us? Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Well, here's a consequence of 2008. We've just run a giant natural experiment on how much money you can chuck into the system to generate inflation, and there's no inflation anywhere. <laughs> so here's my favorite graph. Da, 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 da. It's in Japanese. Right. Uh, so this is the Japanese cabinet office decided to figure out what, or what nominal interest rates were over the very long run. And this is what they figured out. So basically, if you go back to... Has anybody watched Game of Thrones? And uh, you watch Game of Thrones? Come on, admit it. The left can have fun too. Come on, anybody watch Game of Thrones? Right, okay. So imagine that you're offered a chance to own the, the debt of the Lannisters. You'd probably want a high interest rate because there's a very good chance they'll murder you in your sleep. 
There's no secondary market to sell this. You can't swap it out for John Smith bonds, right? So when you have sovereign debts around for the first time, guess what? Lots of risk inherent in the bond. No secondary market to put it off. High real interest rates. What happens is you start to integrate these markets around the 15th century and you begin to increase the pool of capital. So when you increase the pool of capital and drop the risk, what has to happen? The price of money goes down. So the interest rate falls. So over the very long run, what you find is nominal interest rates, because there's very little inflation in the system. Six of the big inflationary spikes that we know of happened in the 1970s. Down and down and down. By the time you get to 1815, the Brits are able to finance the Napoleonic Wars on a perpetual paying 3%. By the time you get to 1941, at the day that Pearl Harbor happens, US interest rates are 1.41%. We forget how real low interest rates are. Why? Because we sample this bit, the 1970s. We generate all of our ideas from this, and we project that future that must never happen again into our models. And that becomes weird because there's the federal funds rate since 1970. That's not going anywhere, and that predates the GFC. So that's going down. You chuck 15 trillion in, and there's still no inflation. That's an interesting world. Now, let's put all this together. You've got a bunch of people who haven't had a wage increase in forever. Their personal balance sheets are bloated. There's no inflation, so there's no inflation to eat their debts as there was in the 1970s. You can't put it on the creditor class. The creditor class runs politics and have never been more powerful, in part because of the inequality skew that this financialization and other processes generate. There we go. Welcome to global populism. Your debts are too high, your wages are too low to pay off the debt, and the inflation is too low to eat the debt. The left response is to blame capital and globalization, and the right response is to blame immigrants and globalization. That's it. Now, from there, let's talk about party politics in the few minutes I've got left. So just read this one. In, in, in a group of 39 European countries, populist parties have improved their share of the vote in national elections to an average of 24.1% in 2017, up from 85 in 2000. And this is not just a function of the financial crisis. They have been around a long time. As I mentioned before, anti-system left parties have transformed southern European politics. Right parties have done the same in European north and east. Vote shares and turnouts for centre parties everywhere have all but collapsed. So what's, how does that fit with this regime story? If you think about the first regime, what type of parties environmentally adapted to that? One where you have mass parties, one where you have real parties of social integration and mobilization that are tamed by post-war welfare states and become what Otto Kirchheimer called catch-all parties, whereby the game becomes move to the middle of the distribution, capture the median voter, and buy everybody off with public goods. The strategy of pushing out the, public, the possibility frontier of public goods hits the buffers in the 1970s in the inflationary crisis and destroys the redistributionary model based upon taxation and productivity increases, especially for left parties. So, right parties never liked this shit. They were quite happy to see it go down, but it caused real problems for basically big left parties. What do you then see? A shift to what various scholars have called the cartel party form. You don't really want to do anything anymore because it gets you into trouble. You've been told by all your economists you shouldn't do anything because you can't do what you think you can do. So what you want to do is push trade out to the WTO. Get your monetary policy and give it to the central banks. Hand it over to the technocrats. Depoliticize it. Reduce the competitive space of party politics and create a cartel that agrees upon where politics should lie and what's beyond the pale for politics. That sounds an awful lot like what happened in the 1990s. That sounds an awful lot about the fragility of things like the Democrats just now, the Labour Party before Corbyn took over, etc. So you're truncating the supply curve of policy, externalising your policy commitments. You're competing more intensely over less. This is perfectly adapted as a forum to the Bernanke Great Moderation world. Because ultimately, governing not very much is fine so long as not very much is wrong. But what happens when your risk optics are wrong? What happens when there's a giant leverage crisis brewing? What happens when you think you understand the system you're part of and you really don't? And then it all suddenly goes wrong and your party systems are unable to respond to it in any meaningful manner. Cartels over the long run, prior to the crisis, invent entryists. The vote share of the centre has been sinking since the 1990s. They've been gaining ground at the same time. The GFC simply accelerated what was there and provided both resources of mobilisation and culturally appropriate frames for people to understand the crisis because the mainstream parties were unable to articulate what was going on, what was wrong and how to fix it. 
Cartel parties today are what we're left with. This is the Democratic Party today. This is the SPD. They are, in one very real sense, the handmaidens, the constructors of the neoliberal global order. Always remember uh, the quote from uh, Mandelson in Britain who said, I'm perfectly relaxed with people in finance getting disturbingly rich so long as we get to tax them. The problem with that is it's an incredibly fragile business model because if it blows up, you've got nothing left except the fact that you cost everyone their assets. So they have no interventionist capacity because they didn't think they needed one. They have no alternative to talk of because they were the people who said there was no alternative. They can't go back to fiscal policy because they enshrined monetary dominance. They privatise Keynesianism. They're dependent entirely on elites for funding. And they have no ability to shift their business model. So why aren't we all dead yet? Very simple. Because populism is the system reset. And there's a left-wing one as well as a right-wing one. We always get stuck up in the strum and drang of the right because they're nasty and we don't like their politics. But there's actually an enormous left-wing response as well built into this. The software's been rewritten, the code's been rewritten from the ground up. It's just not an in institutional forms that we recognize very easily. Second one, I hate to break this to people, but capitalism is anti-fragile. It gains from shocks. I have spent my whole life waiting for the crisis where it ends. It's not like that. It has enormous destructive capacity. It creates human misery on an enormous scale, but it also creates wealth on an enormous scale. And that means it's anti-fragile. It gains from shocks. This will continue. The real threats to the future, climate change, I think passive investment vehicles, happy to talk about that, it's a bit geeky, but nobody talks about it. Compressed term, term premium populism in the Eurozone, they're not a back to the 1930s moment. It's just a false analogy. I'd be happy to explain why. But the real lesson of this, I've got 38 seconds left, I'm timing this brilliantly. The real lesson of 2008 is we know what the system looks like and we know how to bail it. And we'll do it again if we need to. And here's the little slide that shows that. I haven't seen this before. This one is brilliant. This is the aggregate stock of government debt held by central banks. Holy shit. You know that the government of Japan, 80% of JGBs issued since 2012 have been bought by their own central bank? Wow. Have a look at the right one. The green one is public holdings of public debt. Up and up and up and up. What does this mean? It means that if there's another crisis, stop that. It means if there's another crisis, we have, despite what they say, plenty of ammunition and many ways of bailing out the system once again. Let's say equity markets completely tank over the next two years, which I think is really possible. All you're going to do is have the equivalent of QE for equity markets. You just stick a huge amount of liquidity in that and bail the system again and stick it back in the public balance sheet and we will continue to do this. In a weird way, what you've got is socialism through the central bank. I'll leave you with that. That was political economist Mark Blythe speaking at UCLA's Brenner Center. In the exchanges that followed his talk, there was one delicious moment that we want to share with you when he was talking about the relevance of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I just add one footnote to that, which is Bitcoin and, and all cryptocurrencies, right? So here's the thing about, here's how I try to describe Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies to people. If you have to explain to someone it's money, it's not money. It might be something else, but it's not money. If you don't actually use it to buy shit, it's not money. If it has a volatility that makes the Italian lira look like the German mark, it's not money. But you can gamble the crap out of it. Over 80% of transactions of cryptocurrencies are used on various forms of the dark web. That's the only place they're transacted. The rest of the time it is held as a gambling asset for volatility riding it up and down. Now, you can go forever on that one. There's an initial coin offering every moment. And, I mean, literally, Arsenal Football Club has teamed up with somebody for an initial coin only. I mean, it's like, what is this, right? Well, you can create, these are synthetics. So the synthetics have nothing. So you can just, and keep going. You can just keep doing this. And this is the one, and you know, shit coin's the one, and crap coin's the better <laughs> one, right? And you can keep doing this stuff, right? And there's a, there's a fool born every minute, and, and that's it. So that type of financialization in a high-tech network world, you can do that forever. Anything that actually purports to be anything that is connected in some sense to real value has limits, because you can blow bubbles, and bubbles always pop. <laughs>
So that's where I think there's a limit on that one. If it's if it's if it's got bubbly tendencies, like it's not just sort of you know right, then there's limits. But things like cryptocurrencies, you can go as high as you want. I hope I've insulted all the cryptocurrency fans in the room now. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Susie Wiseman. This is Jacobin Radio. Thanks to producer and director Alan Minsky and to Jacobin Radio's Micah Utrecht. Bhaskar Sunkara is the founder and editor of Jacobin Magazine. And special thanks to Robert Brenner. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Susie Wiseman.